Hello and welcome to today's webinar hosted by the Health and Places Initiative, an interdisciplinary group between Harvard University's Graduate School of Design and the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. The HAPPY Project, which is what we call it for short, investigates how to create healthier cities in the future with a specific emphasis on China. My name is Emily Salomon and I'm a research associate with the Graduate School of Design and I'll be moderating this webinar and assisting with any technical questions you may have. Today's webinar is titled Creating Evidence-Based, Healthy and Energy Efficient Housing with Dr. Gary Adamkowitz and Dr. Jack Spengler. It's the fourth in a series of five webinars that feature research conducted by experts involved in the HAPPY project. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website afterwards. A PDF file of the slides will also be pointed online, posted online. But before we go any further, I just want to quickly review the functionality of Adobe Connect to maximize your viewing experience. Your active participation is important throughout today's session. Right now, everyone's on mute to avoid background noises, but if you have any problems hearing us, please click on the audio icon, which is a green button located in the top left of your screen. You'll also see a question and answer box on the bottom right hand side of your screen and this is the pod where you can type in any questions you have during the presentation. When you submit those questions they'll go directly to the moderator me and to our speakers and only we can see the questions you've asked but I will be monitoring the questions as they come in throughout the presentations and following Dr. Damkowitz and Dr. Spengler's remarks will be reading the questions out loud and they will respond to them verbally. You also have access to the chat functionality on the top right hand side of your screen and you can use that chat pod if you experience any technical difficulties or want to get in touch with us during the webinar. So before I hand over the mic I'm going to quickly introduce you to our speakers before you hear directly from them. You can read Dr. Adamkowitz and Dr. Spengler's full biographies on our website. Dr. Adamkowitz is an environmental health specialist with more than 20 years of experience. He's currently a senior research scientist at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, where much of his work focuses on the connections between housing and health and in understanding disparities in environmental exposure. He's also a principal investigator of the Health and in Places Initiative. He's particularly interested in research that aids practitioners in solving environmental health problems within low-income communities. His research has included studies of indoor environmental conditions within the homes of children with asthma and studies that aim to understand the factors that contribute to specific exposures such as pesticides and other chemicals, allergens, secondhand smoke, and combustion byproducts. And we'll be hearing more of that shortly, about that research shortly. And we're also joined by Dr. Jack Spengler, who is the Akira Yamaguchi Professor of Environmental Health and Human Habitation and Director of the Center for Health and Global Environment at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. He's also the Director of the Sustainable Sustainability and Environmental Management Program at the Harvard Extension School. He's conducted research in the areas of personal monitoring, air pollution health effects, indoor air pollution, and a variety of environmental sustainability issues. Several of his investigations have focused on housing design and its effect on ventilation rates, building material selections, energy consumption, and total environmental quality in home. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn over the mic to Dr. Gary Adamkowitz. Thanks, Emily. So Jack Spengler, good morning and uh, happy St. Patrick's Day to all who care about it. Uh, we, we certainly do and are dressing in green today. So I wanted to correct one thing, Emily, that uh, Gary Adepkowitz is a faculty member. He's a professor, uh, assistant professor in the Chan School of Public Health. He's a professor of environmental health and health disparities and that's and health disparities play itself out all across the world in housing issues. And uh, so this is a very appropriate uh, background and uh, subject matter to be talking about. So Gary. All right. Thanks, Jack. Um, before um, and thanks, Emily. And welcome to everyone who's online now um, and those who will be hearing this in the future. 
Um, I just want to start by really putting um, some of what we do in context is that a lot of people are, a lot of us are asking um, big questions about what drives health and health disparities. And, you know, housing is an important part of that um, of that equation, and it falls within this larger s- scope of how the environment affects our health. So everything from diet to neighborhoods and stress and healthcare and occupation, and you know, we're really trying to answer these fundamental questions about these linkages. You know, genes and, envir- and environment play a role in health, but um, what's really changed the, the the landscape of health over the last century is really how um, our environment. Uh, shapes these linkages. And, you know, we uh, more and more are asking questions that lie at the intersection of what makes housing healthy as well as um, what can make housing sustainable. And so as we face the the challenges of climate change, um, as we face various energy crises going forward, um, those are important questions to ponder. But at the same time, we want to make sure that the housing we're designing, building, operating, maintaining, and renovating um, keep, maintain, um, promotes health and maintains health for, for occupants. So really big questions going, going forward. Um, and it's important to really reflect on the energy connections between housing and health. It's, housing is, is a significant portion of energy usage globally, and we, we will, these are um, big questions in terms of cost, but like I said, you know, this intersection between what makes a building healthy and what makes a building uh, energy efficient and sustainable um, can be are important to ask and uh, can be challenging. You know, in a very simple sense, you know, a lot of us who do indoor air quality think about um, moving air through spaces, you know, ventilation, air exchange as being something that can reduce exposure to pollutants that are generated indoors. Uh, but you can also think about the energy impact of moving um, conditioned air. This is obviously a very simplistic view of this, um, but once again, it's sort of a classic um, trade-off that we've we've looked at over the years. And um, the good news, um, I mean, the bad news is that there's a lot. There are a lot of potential links between household exposures and health. The good news is that over the last 40 years, we've actually learned a lot. Um, uh, starting with research that Dr. Spengler pioneered 40 years ago, um, really putting this question of indoor air quality on the stage, um, to recent studies looking at complex chemical exposures in homes. So if you look at this slide, you can see some of the um, exposures that we might be concerned about. I don't think I need to tell people that smoking is bad for you, but secondhand smoke is also bad uh, for for uh, unhealthy for occupants, and there are studies that show that you know living with a heavy smoker can be the same, impart the same risk as being a light smoker yourself. So these are very important risks. Uh, we have a picture of a gas stove. Um, anytime you burn anything in a home, any sort of fuel, whether it's a clean burning fuel like methane or it's that cigarette, you can produce combustion byproducts that can affect health. Um, there's a picture of carpeting, you know, the materials that we bring into homes um, can impart uh, emissions of VOCs, volatile organic compounds, or semi-volatile organic compounds. And this is a very active area of research now. I have a picture of peeling paint. You know, over the years, we've addressed the lead paint issue, lead exposure, or potent neurotoxin, which can affect um, children and and um, impart health problems over their entire life course. Uh, pesticides, pest problems. Um, there's a picture of composite wood here that can emit formaldehyde and other compounds. And in the bottom right, you see a picture of traffic. And this is another important element to think about is that, you know, your indoor air um, is um, can only be as healthy as your outdoor air. So outdoor air infiltrates indoors. And so even if you have a a very a very green home with very few pollutants um, being emitted indoors you can um, have these significant exposures from outdoors so once again a lot of things to be concerned about here you can see just a recap of some of those if we look at 
<clears throat> some of the questions we're asking more and more. It's about these complex chemicals that are being, you know, what we some people call modern chemicals that are being emitted in homes. Um, and some of the concern here is about um, these compounds being endocrine disruptors. So there are synthetic compounds in homes that mimic the um, um, the activity of naturally occurring hormones. So whether it's something that mimics estrogen activity or mimics uh, thyroid hormones, um, that you see a picture of the rubber duck. Um, so um, compounds that soften plastics like PVC um, are have been shown to be endocrine disruptors. These are phthalates. There's the picture of the um, of furniture here. Um, flame retardants are have been shown to mimic thyroid function. So if you think about this complex mix of building materials, consumer products, personal care products, um, either singly or jointly, we're just learning about how these things can affect our health. On the, um, you can see that the the um, particles coming out of the out of the truck, the, the diesel truck. These are also potentially carcinogenic. Um, these compounds, and I have the picture of the thermal image of a home and and the drafty window. Once again, um, aside from all these exposures in homes that we're we're concerned about, we're interested in these connections between. Um, how our homes are built and operated and energy usage. So, um, so I just wanted to start with that big, um, big picture. But once again, in, in very simple terms, you know, the way we think about the, these household related exposures, it's not just about how we build buildings and maintain buildings. It's about human activity. It's about the sources we bring into homes design into homes, like in the example of a gas stove. And it's also how we move air in indoors and outdoors. There are some indoor exposures that aren't necessarily driven by air exchange, you know, with the example of lead paint. But for many of the compounds and the risk factors we're talking about, um, these are airborne exposures. So these chemicals that are, um, you know, in the air, they may be volatile or they may be combustion by byproducts that are airborne for some period of time. So once again, the um, we do know a lot about how these things interact. So the your the determinants of indoor exposure are some function of what sources you have in the home, the characteristics of the structure, and how people live and use that space. Um, in some cases, someone's personal exposure may be driven, uh, strongly driven by the fact that they're spending a lot of time um, using a source indoors, or they're just spending a lot of time indoors. And this is definitely a case for at the sort of the two ends of the life course, you know, um, infants and the elderly may be spending more time at home. And so those risks, and those exposures indoors are more important for them. Um, so aside from their time activity, they may be more vulnerable to these exposures. Um, and as I, you know, re reinforcing the theme that, you know, um, these questions about how do we design and maintain homes can be complicated because we're asking more and more of what we want out of our housing uh, going forward. And so it's not just about um, being healthy or being green, but it's about safety and affordability, energy efficiency. Um, so once again, it can start to feel um, very complicated, but we have actually learned a lot to sort of uh, try to achieve most of these goals and, and um, sort of maximize some of the trade-offs. And related to that, you can, a lot of people think about healthy buildings as being a focus on places. You know, how do we what are the design specs? What are, what are the best characteristics of the place? But always remember that there are elements of behavior, elements of good policy that can keep homes um, healthy from day one and keep them sort of, you know, in another use of the word sustainable, sustainable over, the, over their life course. Um, so let's... What I want to do now is sort of walk through um, some of the evidence base we have that links um, household exposures to health and 
um, this is sort of a big broad brush view. And what I've tried to do is sort of pull um, very thorough scientific reviews that are publicly available so that if you have any more, if you want any more information, you can sort of go to them for the um, for more detail. Um, but once again, this is sort of a th the view from 30,000 feet trying to look at uh, some of what we know about exposures and health. And I'm going to walk through um, a little bit about outdoor pollutants, indoor ventilation, and some chemical and biological exposures. I think it's important to remember, as I said, you know, indoor air um, is is closely tied to outdoor air. So once again, a green building in a very polluted city will still have polluted indoor air. This figure may be a little tough to read, but basically what it shows is um, it's a summary of the weight of evidence that's been collected over the years connecting fine particles in the air, what we call PM 2.5 and diff and mortality. So the risk of death by all cause, cardiovascular disease, cardiopulmonary disease, and basically anything above a zero. And these are like risk, these are percent increase in mortality with an, um, an increase in um, ambient levels of PM 2.5. So as you can see, you know, the consensus is there's no doubt that fine particle levels in the air um, increase your risk of dying on any given day. And this is just one element of the vast body of literature that's been amassed since the 1970s, looking at uh, fine particles and health, whether it's hospitalizations for asthma or, cardi or the risk of having a myocardial infarction. You know, this evidence is very strong. If you think about the connection to buildings, um, we've seen evidence in our own studies that you know, a tighter green building can reduce the likelihood of infiltration of outdoor particles indoors. Um, so if you think about, you know, a tighter building shell, if you think about air filtration, these are all things that can sort of reduce the connection between these ambient levels and your own uh, personal exposure. So I'm just going to walk through some of um, the World Health Organization's reviews that they've done in recent years on um, household related risks and exposures. Um, they did a review in 2012 on combustion byproducts and really highlighted the, the global problem of burning of traditional fuels indoors and the fact that these can be highly polluting uh, activities that can lead to very high levels of particles and carbon monoxide and other, other compounds indoors. And if this is uh, an amazing statistic to me that, um, you know, close to 3 billion people lacked access to clean or modern energy services for cooking, resulting in some 4.3 million premature deaths world, worldwide. Um, some of those deaths are sort of at the um, old, older, in elder years, sort of, um, you know, what we're typically used to seeing in, in the U.S. Um, but a lot of those deaths happen very early in life. Um, so in fact, like um, lower respiratory infections that can cause a death uh, to an infant in the first year of life. So um, once again, this, depending on where you are in the world, this is an element of housing. It's also um, of housing related risk. You can also think of, about this as a risk that can be eliminated as we move people from traditional fuels into more modern fuels or more modern homes. So um, a lot of us obsess now about modern structures and chemical exposures, but if you move someone to from a place where they're exposed to these really high levels of particles into that space, you're probably moving them down uh, the risk curve. Um, in 2009, WHO did a review of dampness and mold and health risk and they also showed that there was overwhelming evidence of connection between that kind of indoor environment and respiratory symptoms respiratory infections a lot of people think about dampness as being um, really just a marker of mold but it's you know in many cases we see evidence that links dampness and health without necessarily having a measurement of a specific mold that caused that problem um, tying this back to um, how we use and operate buildings, you know, um, 
we have to be vigilant not only about infiltration of liquid water, you know, through leaks, water leaks or floods and that sort of thing, but we have to be vigilant about accumulation of humidity indoors and the possibility of um, condensing water on surfaces. Um, in many cases, you know, the mold spores are there. It's just that the missing ingredient is water. So if you can, if you condense water on surfaces, you can grow mold. Once again, but I would say that, you know, this evidence is, is clear and it's, it could be through uh, different pathways, um, growth of bacteria, growth of mold. It's not necessarily that in every case we've identified a mold. Yeah, let me, let me chime in here a little bit. It, there is a, some concern that it also is through an aqueous uh, phase chemical reactions, decomposition of materials. So now you're getting releases of organic uh, materials that you wouldn't have had otherwise if this reaction is going on. So Great. And, and the other thing is, you know, it's not only, you know, it's, um, that's the thing. I think people want to see, you know, mold growth and water stains and, and just, you know, just having elevated, an ele elevated humidity for an extended period of time can, can be uh, linked to these health problems. And just as you're on to that point, there's a clear evidence that one of my uh, National Academy committees, I, I was the chair of climate change uh, mm -hmm. to indoor air to health. And this was a very important, uh, very plausible pathway. Increased precipitations occurring with uh, intense rain uh, falls, snow uh, up against the sides of buildings and snow dams leading to leaking. So this is a real connection to, uh, because the health evidence is so strong, a yep. connection to uh, climate change issues. The um, Another um, review, actually, um, so I, Actually, I'm not sure if Jack was part of the other two reviews. I know Jack and I were part of this review um, um, that the WHO did in released in 2010, looking at an, an, a range of, I've just highlighted four here, but there are actually more pollutants listed in here, um, looking at the evidence for associations with benzene, which sort of used to be something associated with um, um, with traffic related exposures, but any sort of use of solvents and there are a lot of potential um, sources of benzene. Um, in terms of combustion byproduct, carbon monoxide, still something we um, struggle with um, in, um, in the US in terms of um, any sort of um, incomplete combustion, you know, household boilers and that sort of thing. Anytime you don't have sufficient oxygen supply to um, to a fuel burning process, you can produce carbon monoxide and has very serious uh, health implications, you know, from a mild headache to flu-like flu symptoms to death. Um, nitrogen dioxide is something we've been very concerned about over the years. Um, high levels um, in homes associated with asthma outcomes, respiratory outcomes. It's a compound regulated as an outdoor pollutant by EPA in the U.S. Um, and, you know, in most people's homes, you know, the dominant um, source is probably a gas stove. We've just um, looked at um, families transitioning from conventional public housing into green public housing, where gas stoves were replaced with electric, and you can see um, very dramatic reductions in nitrogen dioxide exposure. Um, radon, something that sort of came onto the um, scene as a, as a, I mean, it had been known you know, the, the risks of radon have been known for a long time, but the connections between radon exposure in households and the, the severity of that problem sort of came on the scene in the 1980s. And in terms of there are very straightforward ways of, of eliminating, reducing that risk. Um, obviously, it depends on where you live, your local geology, but you can either design radon mitigation systems into new homes or retrofit um, so once again, there's a design solution to that risk. Let me just say on nitrogen dioxide, uh, some of the highest levels I've ever seen was in public housing in mm -hmm. Chattanooga. And so to take the edge off of cold nights and cold uh, winter days, people would sit in the kitchen, that's where families congregated, cook uh, long simmering cooking of greens and other things, but using the stove as a heating source to get the comfort that we Yeah, yeah. Actually, and we see it, and as Jack um, Jack and I have worked on um, 
um, projects on, in public housing in Boston, and we still see uh, a fair amount of people reporting that. Um, um, I'm sort of jumping ahead, but actually in, a, in our recent study looking at families moving into green housing, what was interesting is that we saw when we asked people about what they were doing in response to the cold, the good news is in the green housing, fewer people were um, were turning to the stove to heat. So it's... it's the comfort uh, aids were being met by better design. Exactly. And so, um, so that type of cold that they were experiencing, the very cold, drafty um, winters that they were experiencing in public housing was the kind of cold that that might have required something as drastic as turning on your stove, but in the greenhousing, it wasn't. It, they were feeling cold, perhaps, but it wasn't that that bitter, drafty cold. Um, so another another common theme. I mean, there are times when I, you know, in talks I kind of simplify this um, too much in, in terms of ventilation, but this is really an important issue in terms of how we sort of move indoor air out, outdoors and we exchange air between indoor and outdoor environments. But there's no doubt that ventilation is a root cause of, of indoor air quality problems in residential and commercial spaces. Um, I just put up two little figures here. One is um, in commercial spaces, um, looking at office productivity and ventilation. Another from um, a, a group of colleagues we have in Sweden, uh, called Gustav Bornhag, looking at air exchange and risk of allergic symptoms. But there's a long um, sort of history here of looking at um, how ventilation, um, more than 100 years of, air, of ventilation standards, really trying to um, look at what's the minimum ventilation in occupied spaces to provide comfort, uh, reduce exposures, and, and reduce uh, symptoms. Um, a few years ago, Jack was part of a team that did a uh, sort of a review of the scientific literature on ventilation rates and health. And this is just, I know this is a little dense of a slide, but really it showed um, that there is a lot of evidence showing how improved ventilation improves health. So how high ventilation rates are in commercial spaces are associated with reduced prevalence of sick building syndrome symptoms. Um, that certain outcomes like inflammation, respiratory infections um, uh, increase when you have lower ventilation rates. And in homes that higher ventilation, ventilation rates have been associated with reduced risk of allergic manifestations. In a Nordic climate, that was the Carl Gustav figure that I shared earlier. Um, but once again, it's still something we struggle, we look at. This is a you know, on that link between um, what makes a healthy home, what makes an energy efficient home. There's no doubt that um, homes need to have ventilation where you are uh, emitting the pollutants that we care about. So in a, in a kitchen, it's really important to ventilate combustion byproducts if you have a gas stove. And we don't always think of water as being a pollutant, but in bathrooms, it's really important to get all that moisture out of, out of the home. Uh, I think it's worth explaining this uh, study that our friends at Chinua University did. Go ahead, uh, Gary. Yeah. It was unique because, uh, because of the housing situation for students. Yeah. yeah so this was basically um, in, a, in um, Chinese um, university looking at dormitories and basically just associating low ventilation rates with a higher likelihood of transmitting the common cold. So higher prevalence of common colds, um, which makes sense, you know, in crowded, poorly ventilated spaces, um, more likelihood of transmitting infectious disease. In fact, it's interesting, if you think about in the US, the first housing laws um, happened in New York City in the 19th century. And a lot of that was, wasn't really driven by you know, understanding what particular pollutants were involved. It was really about um, transmission of infectious disease. So people were living in overcrowded, um, poorly lit, poorly ventilated uh, spaces, and which led to high rates of, so housing is a truly fundamental um, determinant of health, but through the pathway of infectious disease. So you can see it even in a modern dormitory in, um, in China. 
Um, so getting back to the theme of ventilation and, and air exchange, um, this is uh, Jack and I this figure in, in several talks um, as you know an evidence of some evidence of something we know that um, in the '70s with the what we might call the first energy crisis, um, there was a focus on trying to save energy um, by um, making our homes tighter and uh, sort of controlling the flow of that that conditioned air. And you can really see sort of the downturn in normalized le leakage rates as a function of uh, what year a house was built in the U.S. And these are all single family homes. But once again, the, you don't, we're not at the point now where we need to think about these things truly being at odds. You know, you can build a very tight energy efficient building with a energy efficient shell and think about spot ventilation or controlled ventilation or um, energy recovery systems, you know, you don't have to really think about these things being fully at odds. Um, I just wanted to, I know I was sort of focusing on the pollutant side of things, but there are definitely um, health concerns that um, are tied to a wide range of, of exposures in the home. So asthma is a classic example. So um, there are, there's been a lot of work in the last 30 years looking at exposure to combustion byproducts and smoke and allergens and mold. And it's in many cases, um, a child with asthma may be, may have risk from more than one of these. So they may be allergic to cockroaches and be in a home that's where the family is using a stove to heat. So that combination of the elevated nitrogen dioxide exposure and the elevated allergen exposure um, could be really problematic for them. So we're involved in a number of studies trying to look at how you comprehensively reduce exposures. Um, we don't want to be in the world where we're doing one thing at a time. Um, the evidence shows that comprehensive interventions for asthma work, and there's no need to just think about finding the magic intervention. It's important to reduce children's exposure to secondhand smoke and reduce their exposure to mold and reduce their exposure to chemicals. All these things matter um, when trying to alleviate some of these health problems. Um, and just, just to take a step back, I mentioned the combustion uh, review that, WH, that WHO did um, a few years ago. Um, you really can't talk about household exposures um, and health without recognizing, you know, the dominant problem globally. We spend a lot of time looking at exposures within, uh, within the U.S. and Europe, very active research groups uh, looking at these issues. But in terms of the global burden of disease, there's no doubt that these settings are um, really important for health and are contributing daily to really poor health outcomes, including mortality um, risk uh, daily. And so there have been, there's been a lot of progress in this area. And once again, as I said, you know, it's not just about thinking about these exposures, but thinking about what transitions are possible, whether it's moving families from a place um, where they're living in some standard housing, where they're using traditional fuels into, into modern housing, or it's about better stove design. Um, this is a really old table. This is from 1993, Kirk Smith, but I think it sort of highlights this issue. If you look at, you know, typical out, indoor and outdoor concentrations that we see in the in of uh, fine particles in the developed world, developing world, urban and rural, you know, the folks who might have the families who might have the highest exposure day to day are uh, rural families in the developing world who are using these traditional fuels. Um, and a lot of people are, are looking at this issue, and um, I know we've had um, doctoral students working with us, Kathleen, looking at um, populations um, in Western China who are highly exposed, but a lot of work going on globally. Yeah, put this in context in terms of the concentration. This is uh, 50 to 100 times higher than we would see on a typical day in Boston right now. We're at five to 10, maybe 15 micrograms per cubic meter. This is 500. It's probably two times to 
to five times higher than what you see in Beijing on a polluted day, because yep. Beijing might be a hundred or two hundred micrograms outdoors. And that you know, it's interesting. It's um, I always um, I feel like in, in many ways household exposures are hidden exposures. You know, the you know on a bad air pollution day in Beijing or Harbin. Um, it's a very visible problem, but mm -hmm. from, there are many families, you know, behind the walls of their home who are exposed to levels many times uh, those those levels. Um, and this is just a comparison looking at typical exposures. You know, we focus a lot on the particles, but there are a lot of um, um, other compounds that families can be exposed to um, via the um, burning of traditional fuels and biomass and coal indoors. And there's a wide body of literature. I put up three papers that are actually published in environmental health perspectives um, on some of these exposures in places like Nepal, Guatemala, and China. Um, but I specifically pulled the ones from EHP because these are publicly available. You can just download these if you're interested in, in finding out more about these risks. Um, once again, it doesn't discount the problem that we see um, outdoors, um, and this is a figure from uh, a Nature article about lung cancer and outdoor air pollution. And you can see, you know, um, in East Asia, the significant association between um, lung cancer death rates and outdoor air pollution. So once again, not uh, all of these are big problems worthy of our attention. So I just want to spend a little time, you know, we have a lot of very fundamental knowledge about the links between household exposures and health. Um, it's also important to um, understand um, the local evidence, depending on where you are. Um, so, you know, Happy is very much the Happy Project is very much focused on China. Um, there has been uh, an effort over the last decade or so to do housing-based studies. This is uh, really based on a lot of groundbreaking work that was done in Scandinavia. Um, and um, our colleague Jan Sandel, who's at Tsinghua, um, um, took that model of these large cross-sectional studies uh, with various follow-ups in, in different places and brought it to China. And at this point, they've enrolled, you know, probably 70,000 um, families in these studies. This is um, a plot. This is some data that they published in 2013. Um, oh, and the, the CCHH study stands for um, child, child, China's Children, Health and Housing. Thanks, Jack. <laughs> um, and this is looking at the change in prevalence in children's asthma over the over this this 20 year period. Um, and you can see this this increase. I just wanted to quickly. Um, these are a bit busy slides, but you know, in each of these cities, there has been, you know, these very specific health, housing and health studies. But what what they show is that um, it's not just about how a building is designed. It's about the conditions that it, families are experiencing. It's also about family history. It's about activities in the home. So this is just a highlight. You can read this um, sort of after the fact if you want. But, you know, whether you have pets being associated with rhinitis or hay fever, maternal smoking, once again, something very much, um, you know, in control of, of occupants, incense burning, um, being associated with doctor diagnosed asthma. This is out of the CCHH uh, Shanghai study. And if you look at various, the results from um, these different city specific studies, you really get a sense of, you know, the so here for Nanjing, the indoor environment to typical of modern apartments was a risk factor for pneumonia. Um, uh, the odds ratio for my, mice exposure being associated with eczema, this mirrors a lot of the work we've seen in the U.S. where there are particular allergens in the home that might be associated with allergic outcomes, at eczema just being one of several allergic um, outcomes that we look at, including asthma. Um, mold growth, dampness, um, ambient air pollution. So once again, some combination of indoor conditions, outdoor air, um, and indoor activities, whether it's the burning of incense, burn, um, smoking, you know, this is really consistent with a lot of what we've seen other places. But 
um, it's always important to really look at local evidence to, to see whether the risk factors uh, are consistent from place to place. This is, um, we've worked on the CCHH study with some Beijing data, and this is um, a result that we recently submitted for publication showing that living near a main road or highway was associated with a 40% increase in the odds of having sick building syndromes, sick building syndrome symptoms in the past three months. And once again, you know, we all know that ambient air pollution is a problem in Beijing. So this is, um, once again, it's, you know, it's, you know, we tip this list of sick building related syndromes are, are, is something that we developed, people developed to look at household exposures, but once it, but we see a connection with what's happening outdoors. And this is very consistent with the worldwide evidence on the importance of the relevance of traffic related pollution. So let's, to bring this back, I know, so that sort of highlights some of the evidence base in China. Just wanted to bring this back to um, what we can do about this. And this one strategy is um, looking at better building design, green building really, the green building movement really encompasses this, this desire to think about saving resources, saving energy, but also making homes that are healthier. Um, so, um, sorry, oops, one back. Didn't come okay, out. it didn't come out. Okay, there are a couple of images missing from this slide, but there are a lot of there are a lot of um, green building standards that are um, in use. The one that's not showing here is the U.S. Green Building Council's uh, LEED program, and there are other um, um, programs out there, third-party programs that um, allow you to, to sort of look at design according to the standards for, once again, resource, saving resources, um, saving energy, and also making um, buildings healthier. There's also a so China-based. They, they, so they have components that, of course, look at landscaping issues, transportation-related issues, and indoor air quality factors uh, for, I say, office buildings. But there have been now other organizations, including some of these that have focused on healthcare uh, buildings, uh, focused on homes, focused on schools. So I think what you were saying is there is guidance out there yep. that has been now captured into the practice. Thanks, Jack. And um, once again, you know, the, the biggest challenge um, nowadays is um, really thinking about these chemical exposures that are potentially um, important indoors. And, you know, these this this mix of endocrine disruptors is really something that we're all wrestling with in terms of, you know, how how might these things affect the, these exposures affect health? How might they act together uh, to affect some of these pathways? So we have an organization called the Environmental Working Group. This is an NGO that uh, is drawing attention to these issues. This particular picture is interesting. We see a developing fetus and they have done studies and uh, accumulated evidence from others where the cord blood, mm -hmm. so the, the blood that is pulsing through this infant as it's born and leaves its mother has been sampled. and typically finding for all kids, most of the United States this is done, but it's probably true in many other places, 45 or 47 chemicals that are synthetic, mm -hmm. that, are, that are part of our hormonal system yep. that came to that infant, that uh, developing fetus from the mother. So transferred across the placenta of the mother. So these kids have this burden already, and this is startling. And then, then when we are now focusing on, and there's a lot of work being sponsored, including our friend Carl Gustav, who's got 3,000 mother-birth pairs, mother-child pairs, and it are doing careful characterization, not only of their blood and their urine, but the household burden of these chemicals. So once again, this is um, sort of an ongoing story. A lot of um, people interested in this and, you know, the challenge is a lot of these exposures, you know, it's not like traditional toxicology where you sort of have cellular damage or, um, you know, damage at a molecular level. It's really about signaling. You know, it's really challenging to, um, to look at these. So 
Um, there is a lot of emphasis now on eliminating these chemical exposures indoors. And in many cases, we're talking about compounds that aren't chemically bound to materials. So flame retardants in couches can off gas, end up in household dust and be part of daily exposure. So um, a, a big challenge to really identify all these compounds. This is a figure from a paper by um, Charlie Weschler and Bill Nazaroff. Um, not meant to complicate, but it sort of shows how complicated it can be, how these things, these compounds move through the air in our homes. And it's not, um, you know, some compounds are very volatile and they'll sort of evaporate and with air exchange through a space can be eliminated. But uh, we find pesticide burdens of uh, for compounds that have been off the market for years just because they keep cycling through the home and they'll be an com important component of household dust. Um, so I just want to sort of finish with talking about um, perhaps some good news of just one case study in Boston looking at the this movement from conventional housing into green. So once again, as a comprehensive way of, re of making um, trying to make homes healthier and energy efficient. Are we seeing some, some improvements? Um, and this is really part of a, of a concerted effort to make homes healthier um, in this setting. So this is Boston Public Housing. And over the years, they've implemented smoke-free policies, better pest control practices, resident education. But I just want to talk for a second about these green transitions. And once again, this is really about a comprehensive approach to make homes healthier. Um, and this focused on three developments in Boston where families were moved from conventional into green. Um, and so our question, what we really wanted to know is, you know, how do this, we think we know what can make homes more um, healthy, more comfortable, uh, more energy efficient. But the question is, you know, what does the evidence actually show? And this is just some, this gives you a sense of the green attributes of the particular development. So once again, low emitting materials, energy efficient heating systems, um, energy efficient appliances. Um, and so you can, you can look at this at, at another time. And if you, um, this is just a simple schematic. So if people were moving from households where smoking was allowed, they had gas stoves. Um, in general, these were drafty overheated apartments. And so they were moving into places where they had proper ventilation, where it mattered in kitchens and bathrooms, no smoking. Um, so once again, we think we're moving in a direction where, um, where conditions were improved. And what we did is we followed families over two years um, and tried to compare their exposures. So here's an example of what we found. Um, so significant reductions in fine particle exposures in homes, significant reductions in NO2. And this is likely due to, you know, tighter building shells and the re removal of smoking as a source for PM 2.5. For NO2, it's about um, the re removal of gas stoves. We did see, we saw some homes that had reductions in formaldehyde. We saw some homes that had an increase. This wasn't a statistically significant change, but it's something to keep our, our eye on. You know, formaldehyde can come from, a, um, can be emitted by a lot of products, which might be, you know, materials that the families brought from their old apartment to the new. There was even a New England Journal article in the last month looking at formaldehyde exposure from e-cigarettes. You know, there are a lot of potential uh, exposures. Um, but we also saw 40% fewer sick building syndrome symptoms for these families moving. So we think, you know, this is just one example. It's, it's Boston-based, U.S.-based, but it shows what... Um, what you can do if you put all these different approaches together in, in, in a comprehensive way. We also looked at symptoms. You can see um, symptom differences between green and control homes. And I sort of highlighted which ones were statistically significant. So once again, good news. I'm just going to go quickly. We saw for the folks moving from conventional to green, um, a reduction in symptom scores, which you you didn't see any changes between families going from conventional to conventional or green to green. I just This is sort of the last result on this one. Um, one of the really promising outcomes we saw was that we really saw significant reductions in asthma morbidity. This is really important. 
not only as an important health outcome, but as an important cost to our healthcare system. So the asthma burden for these families is really high in this population. And so anytime it's really encouraging to see that you can actually potentially reduce hospital visits or miss school for asthma or asthma attacks. So we're, um, so anyway, I know that was a quick run through that, but um, I want to finish on a broad note, you know, that once again, it's not just about um, building healthier buildings or building energy efficient buildings. If you really want homes to be healthy, you need to think about all these root causes, understand systems, understand the role of um, behavior and education opportunities and systems. And um, your work isn't done when a home is designed and built that maintenance and operations education. can be, education can be just as important. This is not a um, design it and done uh, situation. Um, and we still have a lot of questions that we're interested in asking. Um, you know, we're looking at in our Boston based studies, we're looking at how behavior has changed and perception has changed. I mentioned the case of gas stove use as a heating source has changed. Um, we've also seen cases where um, folks might be colder in green buildings just because they were used to overheated apartments. And so it's important just to understand how people are reacting to their to these new spaces and using them. Um, you should never ignore the occupant um, um, view in, in keeping homes um, green and healthy. Um, this is just an example of some educational materials. Um, you know, at a point of renovation or move in on new construction, it's a great opportunity to work with engaged families on sort of keeping a home healthy from day one. Um, you know, in all the studies we do, probably the most motivated families we work with are parents who have a child with asthma, they're very motivated to keep a home healthy. But I think when someone moves into a, a nice new green um, home, it's a great another great op opportunity to, to work with an engaged family. Uh, I think this is the last slide. I just want to end on some, some you know, on a happy, happy note. Um, this is over the last 10, more than 10 years, uh, Jack and I have been working with uh, the Boston Housing Authority on various projects that in, that are aimed at re improving conditions and improving health, uh, and we, we've been part of a larger community in Boston uh, working on this. And in a recent analysis, um, the Boston Health Commission showed that uh, the percent of the adults reporting asthma symptoms has dropped in BHA housing and it hasn't dropped in any other category of housing in, in Boston. So um, we can't show specifically that that's related to all these housing improvements, but it's certainly consistent with it. So we're, we are encouraged um, by that work. These are just some acknowledgements for the, um, the Bright study. And, if, um, and this is our funding um, uh, for the Bright study came from the US Department of Housing and Urban Development funding for the happy project came from the CP group and I have my email address up here um, you can get both mine and Jack's at the happy website um, so thanks um, to the folks who are on uh, we're happy to take any questions if, if anyone has any Emily? Well, in a, in a few moments left here, uh, Gary, um, I think I want to go back to two of the things you said about uh, <clears throat> how to be vigilant in the design, but also through the operations and the systems is very important, particularly public housing, because it's we think of individual private housing, the system is you and the building, right, interacting mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the elements of uh, of nature but in public housing it's you it's the structure and it's the management of that structure and and how vigilant and how diligent they are to uh, 
to the repairs, to the uh, broken steam vents, uh, the all the things that happen in buildings uh, that are aging, of course, in time. And so understanding even the organizational management of the property is an important part of the system overall. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And the um, in fact, in our in our bright intervention, um, if you look at the improvements we've seen in symptoms and and asthma outcomes, um, it's interesting. Within the green side, um, you can actually see um, less of an improvement in cases where pest problems came back. So that's the thing. It's not you're not. You're, as you said, right? It's, things aren't over um, when you've constructed it. The the maintenance and the the vigilance that you need to sort of keep things um, healthy is important. And the other uh, example of of uh, system thinking it came out of a study that Bud Offerman did in California. It was a follow up of hundred more than a hundred homes that were built to the highest ener energy efficiency standards of California. And uh, so they were thermally tight, they met the comfort thing. And they had modern uh, HVAC systems, ventilation systems. And because the homes were thermally well designed, the heating and cooling system wasn't going on often enough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So surprise, surprise, they had low, low ventilation rates. They wouldn't even meet the ventilation standards set by ASHRAE or recommended by ASHRAE, the American Society for Heating and Refrigerating, Air Conditioning and Refrigerating Engineers, that is used for designing homes. Uh, so, so what have they accomplished? They got an energy efficient home that is underventilated, and they showed higher formaldehyde and other contaminants. And Gary and Jack, I'm sorry I lost connectivity for just a short moment, but. One of the questions that I have is, um, you talked a little bit about green building standards in the U.S., and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the state of green building in China, since at least through the Bright study that you talked about, there are some clear benefits to the folks that are living there that have moved from conventional housing. Well, let's just put it in perspective. Uh, China is going is the epitome of urbanization that is occurring around the world, with but it's occurring at a phenomenal scale. And it's moving people into high rise for the most part, not all, but uh, dense high rise uh, buildings, uh, which have their own dynamics. Uh, if they're not zoned properly, if uh, their care isn't made for the materials and our friends in China tell us there's something else that's unique about it is that oftentimes you buy a, an apartment that is unfinished. I mean, the electrical units aren't in there, the wiring, the plumbing, the tiles, the finishing. So as other people finish off their own units, the entire building is a construction site for years. This is phenomenal. I've never you know, experienced such a thing. Usually you get a finished product when you buy an apartment. Not so over there. So not only is it you know, personal care products and combustion that we talked about, you also have all the other things from fresh adhesives and paints and and uh, and uh, particle dust and everything else that's going on is the elevators that they share are also conveying construction workers and materials. So that is not taken care. Of. People aren't. That's not included in these global definitions out of the uh, Green Star system uh, that the Chinese use to have high performance buildings. That that this phenomenon is not included. So. I would say, um, you know, we, there's gaps. There's gaps in our thinking. There's gaps in the applications. And um, I can't speak to this issue, Emily, but there's also, the, you, one has to be very concerned about the integrity of the system because there is a branding element of having, uh, having a lead system or having a, uh, a Bream or a Casme Ka or any of the other, Green Star, there's a, so the tr proof is really in the operational side. Does, do these standards really um, generate a, a livable, workable environment uh, that persists? And that's one of the key questions that we don't know. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Well, it seems like we are at our one hour for the presentation. I want to thank you, Dr. Adamkowitz and Dr. Spengler, for joining me. This was really a thorough 
presentation, and um, you raise a lot of really interesting questions, I think, about uh, what's going on in China and really thinking about this as a much bigger issue than just the building itself. It's really about the behaviors and the surrounding environment, too. So, again, thank you so much for joining. And I want to remind folks that they can download a recording of this webinar and the PowerPoints on our website, which the URL is up on the screen. And we have one more webinar as part of the Happy Webinar series coming up next week, which will be on health assessment tools. So what practitioners, both in the planning and public health fields, can use to really think about the connections in their community for plans, proposals for new development, and for existing places. So uh, Dr. Adamkowitz and Dr. Spengler, thanks again so much. And thanks to everyone that joined this afternoon. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you. Those, uh, Emily, were